Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm really happy to be um, giving that talk today because basically esports and the game of esports have, have shaped my life for the past 15 years. So uh, it's really exciting for me to um, tell you how I see them. Um, first, I will start with um, a very short definition of esports. Um, many people wonder are esports real sports or Actually, I, I don't care, and people in esports don't really care. Esports is just a label. Um, esports is a label for what you could call competitive video games. And basically, th they started really early. You could say Pong is an esports game uh, that has very little depth and very little replayability, but you could start from there. Um, oh, hello. So. Esports started before 1999, but I started in esports in 1998 when I discovered StarCraft, basically, uh, and playing on Battle.net. And I, I was a huge fan of the NBA back then, and, uh, and I was a very big gamer. And when I realized that I could play StarCraft with anyone online in the world, uh, and I could compete, uh, I started to think one day there would be Michael Jordans of um, video games, basically. And Stop it. <laughs> so, um, no, stop it, I said. Um, so, in 1999, I was a fan of a StarCraft player whose nickname was Xylius. And he was a StarCraft World War Beta champion. Blizzard organized this tournament and, um, upon release of the expansion, and he won it. He was also the number one on the ladder. I was a very, I was a hardcore StarCraft player. I, I think I played 5,000 hours of StarCraft, but I wasn't talented. Uh, to the point that I could be a pro gamer. Uh, he was he was the best, uh, one of the best. And he was theorizing uh, his, his play and the way he played a lot. And he wrote a lot. Back then, we didn't have replays. So to share games, after games, we wrote battle reports. So we took after we played a game of 20 minutes, we took four hours to tell others online uh, what the game was about and what happened. So we did that a lot. And he was really theory crafting StarCraft very much. Um, and actually, um, that guy, nine years later, he was hired by Riot Games. He's the VP of game design for League of Legends nowadays. And that guy, he coined the term easy to learn, lifetime to master. It's really disturbing. Uh, the video, I'm sorry, it's disturbing myself. It's really sad. What can I say? Um, easy to learn, lifetime to master is something you may have heard a lot. The first time I read it was from that guy. And that guy is now running League of Legends, basically, in terms of game design. And he's been running the game from the start. Um, so basically, my talk is going to be about how you go from those gamers to a super successful business based on esports. Uh, because Zylias is one of them, but he's not the only person, of course, who's been like really pushing uh, the, this field. Nowadays, esports, what do they represent? In, on October 13th, when I did this uh, presentation, I went on Steam and I checked Steam stats, uh, which are really useful because they're public, anyone can check them out. Uh, the first game on Steam is Dota 2, and it has 800,000 concurrent players uh, at peak each day. The number two game is Counter-Strike uh, Global Offensive, uh, 200,000. Third game is Team Fortress 2. Um, which is not esports, but uh, it's what I would call game as a hobby, uh, game as a service. Uh, it doesn't have the competitive aspect to it, but it has everything else that's in esports. Um, meaning people have been playing this game for years on end. The ninth game on Steam was Counter-Strike, the original Counter-Strike. The original Counter-Strike released in 1999, well, the beta in 1999, had, was the number nine game on Steam just two weeks ago. And actually, just a year ago, it was played more than the new Counter-Strike. And then the first game that looks like an a, a triple A that I could find in the list is actually uh, Assassin's Creed. Uh, it's, it had 3.7 thousand people playing. It's the 60-second game. Uh, on day one, it peaked at 16K. So Assassin's Creed is not PC only, of course, and it's mainly not PC, it's mainly a console game. But even if you multiply the number, let's say by 30 here, 
the 16K. You say there are 30 more people playing Assassin's Creed on day one on, on consoles that are on PC. It's still not as big as Dota, as Dota is every day in terms of number of players. So it's, it's a really different approach to video games. And Assassin's Creed is a huge success in many, many, many ways. And so is, I don't know, God of War, The Last of Us, um, all of those AAA games, you know, that makes the industry. Uh, but they they are very different in the sense that people don't get to play them for years and don't stick to them as much as they do with the, the games above. So this, this, graph, this graph here, uh, it's the same stats <coughs> as these ones, basically. The yellow is Dota 2, blue is Counter-Strike, Counter-Strike Go, red is Team Fortress 2, so see, it's a really, really small graph, and that's because I wanted to show you where League of Legends is on this graph. That's where it is. And that was in February of 2014. So maybe now it's, it's very likely that it's much bigger. Actually, League of Legends itself is as big as all of Steam in terms of concurrent players. It's the basically seven, eight million people on the platform at all times. So these are the numbers. Seven million concurrent players uh, every day uh, at peak in February of this year. 27 million uh, players a day, 67 million players a month. It's huge, uh, but you can get bigger. Candy Crush has double players each month. At least two years ago, that's what they were claiming. Maybe they have more now, maybe they have less, I don't know, but um, there's still room for, for bigger. And each dot here is a press release by Riot Games announcing th the numbers. So it's not like Steam where you have like permanent public data. There you have to trust Riot Games. But I mean, you've all heard about League of Legends and seen pictures and well, the numbers match what we can see basically. So esports history, before 1998, uh, then I, I'm, there are three big phases for me in esports, which is basically the first one, a new hope where people really discover new stuff and new dreams were born. Then there was a second uh, phase, which was the long slide where esports didn't seem like they were going anywhere. And then now from 2010 to now, uh, well now, um, thanks to League of Legends, Dota 2, Counter-Strike Go, um, Call of Duty, etc., cetera, uh, esports is getting huge and you don't really know where uh, it's gonna stop. So before 1998, so the first game could be, the first video game, as far as I know of, could be called eSports, an eSports game, it's a competitive game. Then Street Fighter also is one of the bases for eSports and it's still played as an eSports game, even though it's not like one of the very, the biggest ones. Uh, and you could say any one-on-one -on -one game is, uh, has some, some of eSports essence in it. Uh, then in the 90s, uh, with games like Warcraft, Quake, Doom, Command & Conquer, Age of Empires, first, the first multiplayer games on PC, we saw the birth of esports. Uh, and on these games, the community started to grow uh, out of nowhere and they started to organize their own tournaments because they liked those games so much that they wanted to prove they were the best. Uh, and so they had to, you know, compete and to do it all by themselves. And that's basically at the end of the 90s is when I, I got involved uh, playing StarCraft. And in 1998 and 1999, those three games, StarCraft, Counter-Strike, and Quake 3 come out and they bring really a uh, new uh, fresh air uh, to multiplayer games. Uh, also at the same time, we start to see, in 1999, I was running a gaming center because I quit studying because I played StarCraft too much. So I was running a gaming center and we were beta testers for ADSL in 1999, so it's also the, the apparition of you know, the broadband internet that allowed for the, that first burst. Uh, tournaments started to appear, money tournaments started to appear in the West, and in, in Korea, something really unexpected happened is the Korean, the scene boomed like crazy. I, I guess you all heard about this too. Um, they, they started to run TV shows where people were playing StarCraft. In 1999, I was watching video streaming of StarCraft programmers in Korea, and the quality was, was awful. It was like, 
<laughs> it was now that you think of Twitch, of course, and or YouTube, it's it's crazy to think how, how bad it was. But we were so much into it, we wanted to see that. And then some Western players managed to move to Korea and to be pros there, and they were our idols. Uh, we were crazy about these guys. They they were doing something uh, that was like um, not human. And so new dreams were born, the NBA of video games, uh, basically. Uh, one day, people will be paid to play games and they will be stars because they will be doing it like no one does. And we already had stars like that. There's a French guy called Elki who is now a poker professional. He went and moved to Korea and uh, he was a hero for us. <coughs> Then from 2004 to 2009, the, the long slide. Warcraft 3 and CS Source are disappointing games. And don't get me wrong, they are disappointing games from an esports standpoint. Uh, we will talk about this uh, more. Uh, but Warcraft 3 didn't boom in Korea. Uh, it did work in the West, where Blizzard's marketing was the, the most powerful. But in Korea, StarCraft kept the main game. It actually kept, it stayed the main game up until StarCraft 2 was released. And I'll talk about this later, but basically, uh, Warcraft 3 wasn't that good of a game esports-wise. CS Source uh, wasn't that good of a game at all, if you ask me. Uh, and so the esports fans that we were, we were left without games where uh, pro gamers could express their talent. And it's, the scene started to go down. Dota started to be played a lot already. Uh, it was created in 2003, 2004, but it wasn't considered for esports. We were convinced, esports people, we were convinced that Dota was not a spectator sport and that no one would ever watch Dota because it was too complex. And we were running esports, you know, we were at the forefront, but we, Dota was a lot of fun to all of us. Like we played for hours, but we think it wouldn't work. Um, we didn't have TV shows. We were seeing Korea with all those shows and we didn't get those. And uh, we were starting you know, to get desperate. Like, why, why don't they want TV shows? It's so exciting. I mean, it's games, it's competition, it's like sports with video games, but TV stations didn't want to run them. So basically, it, it was the first crisis for esports. The um, things were going down. Counter-Strike was still the main game. Warcraft 3 was the second game in the West wasn't the same as StarCraft in terms of excitement. And then um, Call of Duty started to appear uh, on the PC with the first Modern Warfare. Uh, it was a really, really good uh, FPS to be played competitively. Then 2010, 2014, something new happened. First StarCraft 2, when StarCraft 2 was released, there was a lot of uh, momentum in the West to reproduce the Korean phenomenon. Uh, and so, uh, it, it really uh, gave a huge kick, uh, and esports started to get back to what they were in the beginning, at least to my eyes, in terms of uh, excitement and expectations and uh, how big the tournaments were getting and stuff. But the real breakthrough came with MOBAs, as we saw. League of Legends is ten times as big as Dota 2, and Dota 2 is four times as big as Counter Strike. And back then, Counter Strike was the biggest game, so it's it's really crazy how big they got. Um, for your information, just StarCraft 2 uh, is not played that much, actually. Uh, StarCraft 2, I would say right now, if it were on Steam, it would be something around the maybe 20th or 30th game on Steam, I think. Um, then not only MOBAs uh, were really good for esports, but then Counter-Strike finally came back to life just last year, actually, last year, and we, we'll see, we'll talk about that too. Um, Console games started to push hard. Uh, Super Smash Bros. Uh, is a great game for esports. Uh, Naruto is, is played a lot. Call of Duty is played a lot too, of course, on consoles. Game makers start to understand what to do and how. They still have uh, a lot to learn, especially AAA publishers. Making an esports game is very different from uh, selling uh, games in boxes uh, once a year or once every two or three years. Uh, and then um, you had the streaming platform, especially Twitch, of course. And now you have what TV didn't do. And maybe TV didn't do it because they were scared of video games. They don't, didn't really understand. I don't know what TV didn't do. Twitch is doing it. And they, they're serving themselves pretty well doing it because, I mean, I keep reading articles saying their viewership, their global viewership is getting, it can be compared to ESPNs. So it's... 
it's it's very really good for them. It's very really good for esports. And so the NBA video games is not so far. Actually, some people might say it's already there with the um, League of Legends uh, League Championship Series, which is their their huge pro league, which is shaped after the NBA in many many ways. Uh, but it's it's still gonna go bigger. So the main games for this time, uh, there are more, uh, and there will be more in the future. League of Legends, Dota, Hearthstone, Blizzard. Blizzard did an amazing job with Hearthstone. They, it, it's crazy to think such a game with no animation and no 3D is there. And it's one of the most watched games in the world at the moment. Um, Counter-Strike, Call of Duty on console, of course. Um, Smite, which is a, a third-person MOBA on the PC, has a tournament in January coming, uh, and they already have $1 million in cash prize funded by the community for the tournament. And it's only in January. Maybe they will have three or four uh, at the time of the tournament. So the games of esports. Now that we've seen uh, an overview of the history of esports, uh, the games, I, I chose those games. So to me, StarCraft and WarCraft, and I mean WarCraft, the RTS, not the RPG, of course, uh, they are the same franchise. Um, then Counter-Strike, Dota, and League of Legends. And we'll go through each of these games and um, look at their history and see how they became what they are, basically. So here in green, it's when the games are released. And in black, it's so just commenced by me. When it comes to StarCraft, I don't have that much comment to do about how these games were made because Blizzard is pretty secretive. Uh, and also Blizzard, they don't really have people impersonating their games. Uh, it's, it's really, to me, it looks like a huge, very nice machine that's already a corporation, but that's also super well focused on creating amazing experiences for gamers like very few people can actually. So it's a... Um, it started in 94 with the first Warcraft game. Uh, then Warcraft 2, as far as I know, is when the first tournaments appeared. Starcraft, that's when it got serious in the West. And then in Korea, it really literally boomed as, we, as I talked about already. But Blizzard didn't really master uh, the esports side of Starcraft, I would say. Uh, I have tons of respect for Blizzard. They made me quit my studies with their game. Uh, I love, I use their StarCraft 2 editor a lot. Uh, it's what they do. I think Blizzard is the next Disney, basically. But when it comes to esports, it's really hard to master all of the factors. Then in 2010, they read, Star, they read StarCraft 2, uh, and it wasn't um, as successful as the first one. It's a bit like Warcraft 3, actually. It didn't really boom like it did, especially in Korea. And at the same time, Blizzard, they kind of got in difficult talks with the Korean actors. The esports scene in Korea happened without Blizzard at all. They, they, they had no uh, input into it. And when StarCraft 2 came out, they decided they wanted to get it back. Uh, and so they might have hurt themselves. <coughs> Sorry. They might have hurt themselves doing so. Uh, and then in 2012, they launched their own uh, championship, which is the World Championship Series, WCS. It's, it's their uh, official league, which has an annual um, conclusion at BlizzCon uh, every year uh, in a very big tournament. So to sum things up about what happened with StarCraft, Blizzard didn't expect the esports phenomenon, especially not what happened in Korea. And as great as Warcraft 3 was, and I mean, I spent a lot of time playing this game, it wasn't as good as StarCraft 1. Uh, and it's, I mean, once again, you gotta give Blizzard credit with Warcraft 3, and they always do that, basically. They, they, they tested stuff. Uh, they changed uh, some of the core gameplay. They added heroes. They made units longer to kill. And by doing this, I mean, they were trying exciting stuff, but they might have lost other stuff on the way. StarCraft 2 is not as good as StarCraft 1, sports-wise, too. Uh, my opinion is by... They tried to lower the barrier of entry. Basically, the issue with a game like StarCraft is it's, it's pretty complex. If you're not a geek, if you're not... I mean, it takes a long time to learn. If you compare this to Call of Duty, it's, uh, you have to learn a lot of stuff. You take trees and... So 
if you're a geek, you like that. If you're a future engineer, you like that. But most of the people don't. And so Blizzard, they tried to lower that barrier at the entry. But by doing this, they also lowered the curve at the top. So you end up with less exciting uh, competitive matches in StarCraft 2 than you had in StarCraft 1 because the learning curve is not steep enough at the very top. And I mean, at the very top, you're talking about a learning curve that needs to make a difference between people that have played 20,000 hours of the game and that are the most talented in the world. Um, it's so you really have to have a game that is ex extremely challenging at the highest level. And StarCraft 2 is not as challenging as StarCraft 1 at the highest level. So, and, and in Korea, like I was saying, they, StarCraft 2 wasn't as successful as the first one. They got into those talks with the Korean actors because in Korea you have like TV channels that, that are made to run StarCraft shows. Uh, you have uh, a professional uh, league of players that are, you know, are super, uh, are here to defend the players basically against the, the, the TV stations and against Blizzard in the end. So. Uh, they got into art talks with those guys, and at the same time, League of Legends was really making a lot of efforts in Korea, and so League of Legends became the number one game in Korea, by far. So right now, Counter-Strike, just to finish in Counter-Strike, it's going down. Uh, uh, not Counter-Strike, sorry, StarCraft has been going down. Uh, it's good for Blizzard that they have Hearthstone, but StarCraft has been going down. I think it will stay for a long time. I still like StarCraft a lot. I, I watch a lot of StarCraft matches. And I think many people are like me, but I don't see it going back up or competing with MOBAs in terms of popularity or even Counter-Strike in the future. Um, here we are with Counter-Strike. That's a more in even more interesting story. Counter-Strike beta was released in 1999. There's one guy basically who created all of Counter-Strike. He's called Guzman. And um, he was helped by another guy called Cliff who was basically handling the promotional aspect and the website and stuff. Um, Guzman was hired by Valve when they bought Counter-Strike in 2000. In only a year or a year and a half, Counter-Strike had spread like mad, uh, all by itself. Once again, it's a bit like StarCraft in Korea. It's a phenomenon that is not controlled in any way by marketing or business. It's just a game that is so powerful that it just spreads. Uh, and you don't, you don't even, basically what I say usually about sports games is they don't need marketing. They are the marketing because they are so powerful in terms of the emotions that they drive among players that they have to spread. But that also means your game has to be legendary. Uh, an esports game is first and foremost an amazing video game and amazing is not strong enough. It's in the past 15 years, and there haven't been 15 games that were released that have esports potential. Uh, and it's not a choice by gamers. They just go to what is the best to them. So basically, Valve noticed this and they said, oh, let's, let's, let's hire Guzman, let's buy CS. So they did. But the, the, um, the relationship, I had the chance to meet Guzman last year, which was one of the biggest, like, uh, I don't know, meetings I had in my life. Uh, I spent seven years of my life basically uh, inside Counter-Strike, running a programming team, watching matches 40, 50 hours a week to make them the best, to help them become the best like a, a football coach would. So to me, Counter-Strike is, uh, is, is huge. And so when I met the creator of the game, I, I was really happy. And he actually confirmed all the assumptions that we had made as gamers seeing the game evolve over time. So basically, they hired him, but they didn't uh, get on well with him. Uh, and he didn't get on well with them. Uh, he was supposed to make Counter-Strike 2 at Valve, but he didn't. And then they, they, um, they parted ways, and Counter-Strike 2 never came out. And they parted ways at a version of Counter-Strike which is called 1.3. So basically, the historical version of Counter-Strike is 1.6, the one that's when you talk about the original Counter-Strike right now, you talk about 1.6, but before 1.6 came 1.3. It's the last version that Guzman worked on. And if you ask Counter-Strike people, it's actually the best version, the best version of Counter-Strike ever. It's 1.3. And the way I understand things, or to make an image, is basically Valve, they bought the symphony, they hired Mozart, and then they let Salieri make the, adjust the adjustments. 
They had the genius. They had everything they needed. They had the, and they let it slip. They let it slip because some people thought, you know, they knew better. Uh, and I got confirmation over time, uh, many times, that that's how people were thinking. So Counter-Strike 1.6 in 2003, uh, it's when the name Counter-Strike 1.6 froze because they released Steam at that point. And they stopped naming versions because the idea of Steam, the initial idea was we will push content to you on a regular basis. We don't need new versions. We don't need big updates anymore. So they stuck with the name 1.6 at that time. Then in 2004, they released what initially was supposed to be Counter-Strike 2, Counter-Strike Source, and it never beat 1.6, never, ever. It wasn't even close. In 2007, 1.6 still had 85,000 concurrent players uh, playing on Steam. So right now, it would make it the third game on Steam. Uh, and then in 2012, Valve released Counter-Strike Global Offensive. And it was uh, a failure initially. Just a year ago, Counter-Strike 1.6 was played more than Global Offensive and more than Counter-Strike Source. Even now, as, you've, as we've seen earlier, it's still the ninth game on Steam. It's 15 years old. It's against every law of game marketing and business. It's, it's ugly. It's old school. It's, but we don't care. It's interactions. It's the emotions that count. Um, then what happened in 2013? CSGO finally took over. In 2012, I was talking, I was a consultant for uh, Ubisoft at uh, PAX, and I met the best uh, Counter-Strike player in the US, uh, basically, uh, some guy called um, Nothing. And he was telling me about how uh, bad he felt because Valve, they, they kept asking him and his friends for advice about the game, but they never replied them. And because they were basically saying, oh, you know, we know how to make games. Uh, and so, Counter-Strike for 10 years was basically ill-treated by Valve, you could say it like that. And in 2013, they just decided to, <laughs> to listen to people, to listen to what basically gamers had to say. So that's the story I told you. Um, Valve, really, they committed a mistake, and I mean, I I'm saying this because they didn't commit it again with, with Dota 2, actually. It's maybe Dota 2 that put Valve on the right direction with uh, Counter-Strike Go. Um, so they, they bought the game there, the man, they built a team of millions of Counter-Strike fans if you wonder how to um, uh, monetize a, a free-to-play game, that could be an idea, you know, build a database and sell, them, sell games to them. Uh, it took them 10 years. The difference between failure and success, it's a few game design tweaks, really. The difference between Counter-Strike Go uh, being a failure and Counter-Strike Go being the second game on Steam and going up, it's, it's what, it's the feeling of the weapons. And I mean feeling. It's video games are, I, I, I don't wonder, I don't ask myself if video games are art. Uh, what I know is that <coughs> there's a huge difference between um, Counter-Strike Go a year ago and Counter-Strike Go now. And the difference is mostly between how uh, is, is, in, is into how the um, weapons feel. You have to feel power, basically. In Counter-Strike, people come and get, are looking for power. It's, they're looking for the thrill of killing. It's, it might be hard to say, but at, in the end, that's that. People like blood. People like to feel powerful. I think the mic is off. People like to feel powerful uh, shooting other people. It's in our DNA. We've been defending our territory ever since we've been born, basically. I mean, human race, um, and so that's what you have in Counter-Strike, and the more powerful you feel shooting the weapons, um, the more success your game is going to have. And then you have other emotional aspects to it, uh, but I would say it's the biggest difference between the old school Counter-Strike and what Valve did that didn't really work. All th other things that were really important uh, were the matchmaking. They really improved the matchmaking, which is a way to lower the barrier to entry again. You don't have to struggle to find a good match, and you can find it really quick. Uh, they also uh, added the weapons market, which I think 
uh, is a very powerful uh, tool for gamers to get them really excited about the game, but also it's a very good way to monetize. I think Valve um, doesn't want to communicate about how much money they're making selling uh, weapons. I know people who bought a, a knife in Counter-Strike for $300. It's, uh, it's really crazy. I see videos on YouTube where people open what they call boxes. A box is, a, is, is a, in Counter-Strike, it's, it's a box of skins. So you buy a box and you don't know what you get in it. It's random. And when you get a good skin, you, you're really ha happy about that. It's really important. And it makes money. So we go with Dota now. Um, Dota, in 2003, it's a bit like Counter-Strike, you're going to see. Uh, except that Valve this time, they didn't mess up, basically. Uh, Dota uh, is a custom map for Warcraft 3. The first designer is uh, Earl, Eo, I don't know how to say it. He, he created the map basically. So Dota is, is a mix of many, many things that were going on on the uh, Warcraft editor and in, in, in custom maps created by gamers. It's a mix of many concepts that were working and that got improved over time. And so the first one came up with a map called uh, Defense of the Ancients, Dota. Uh, it's Earl, and uh, he ran it for a year. and. Just in a year, it became uh, extremely popular. Uh, we were playing it with friends, and I know friends that uh, never played Warcraft that bought Warcraft just to play Dota uh, because they like RPGs, because they like Diablo, they like Warcraft. Dota, in a way, is a mix. It's a second generation multiplayer game in the sense that it's a mix of other multiplayer games' concepts. It's Diablo. It's a very short game of Diablo. Uh, it's, uh, of course, it looks a lot like StarCraft and the RTS games in terms of uh, micromanagement. And then it's a lot like Counter-Strike too, in the sense that it's five on five, you need to communicate a lot. You're nothing without your team. Uh, it, it requires a lot of interactions and um, coordination with other players. So, Ill was the first uh, guy to, to make it. Uh, then. Ginzo was in charge for a year or two. Uh, and then Ice Frog was in charge from, let's say, 2005 until now. And the community manager, the guy in charge of the website, was Fendragon. So, Eil, this guy, we don't know where he is. Ginzo is at Riot Games. Fendragon is at Riot Games from day one. They hired them right away. Uh, and Ice Frog is at Valve. So in 2007, Dota was played by millions each month. It was already the case in 2004, 2005. I ran a Dota tournament in 2004, a very small one, you know, with friends. Uh, and, uh, but we didn't think it was serious. It was for fun, you know. Uh, Dota played by millions. In 2009, Valve hired Icefrog. That day I was happy. I was really happy because that guy, Icefrog, uh, for us, is, is legendary. Uh, no one knows his face. No one knows his name. Uh, the people I know that go to Valve to work on Dota or to play at the international, they, they tell me they've never seen Ice Frog, or if they have, they don't know that they have. <laughs> so when Valve hired Ice Frog, I was really happy because I, th I thought to myself, this guy wouldn't go there uh, if he didn't have you know, the, 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 the conditions that he was you know, requesting to make a huge, a huge game, a great game. I was like genuinely happy. Uh, in 2010, Valve registered the trademark. It's more, uh, it's more of a fun fact, but basically it created a small, you know, PR war between them and Riot Games as to, you know, did they have the right to register a trademark that was created by the community, by no company. Then in 2011, they released the Dota 2 beta and they, they made the first breakthrough in esports. Like they, they really made a big, big step with the international, uh, which is their yearly big tournament. They put $1.6 million as cash, for a cash prize. Uh, it was at Gamescom. It was uh, highly successful and it really started uh, Dota 2 as an esports game uh, right from the start. Then in 2013, the game was officially released. And this year, TI4, or the International 4, the first fourth edition, generated, that's my estimate, 40 million in revenue, basically. They, they generated eight or nine million of cash price out of the community by buying the compendium, but the compendium is, I think it's 25%, to 30% of the money goes to the cash price, which means if you multiply by three, you get, you get revenue that they got from the compendium, which is about 30 million, and then 
you have everything that's related to uh, merch, the fact that they run the tournament in a huge NBA venue in Seattle with uh, 50,000 people at capacity for four days, etc. These sports have become an economy uh, as well as a game that's played a lot. Uh, so this time they didn't mess up. They hired Ice Frog and then they let him do you know, what he wanted. And I'm talking about these people, Ice Frog or uh, Dalius or uh, Guzman, and don't get me wrong, I mean, it's, it's like in cooking, uh, it's like in music. Uh, you need a chef. Uh, the chef is nothing without a good team. Uh, just like the maestro is nothing without a good um, uh, people playing the instruments. And uh, there are, I'm sure these people are more aware of it than I am, but you still need someone who will make sure that the recipe is right, that uh, the magic can happen. Uh, it's really, really important. And this time, Valve didn't uh, mess up. And Dolet has been growing constantly like we saw, you know, the, the, the yellow line was going up all the way. And even more than not messing up, actually, uh, and, and I have a lot of respect for Valve too, even though they, they, they didn't really help Counter-Strike for a long time. But, what they're doing with Dota is crazy. It's, uh, if you go and open the game, um, it's the future of eSports, basically. It's, they are the first one who made the community pay for a cash price, for example. And the success is amazing. Uh, they have a skin system where people can uh, submit skins for the game. If the skins are accepted in the game, then they get sold. They have a ref share system for the people that create those skins, and some of these people are amazingly talented, and they create amazing skins. Uh, they have a sp the spectating options in the game are crazy. You don't have to watch that Dota Pro matches through Twitch or YouTube or whatever. You can watch them inside the game with the maximum video quality because there's no video compression, actually. You're inside the game engine, but you still get the commentary in the language that you, that you choose. So you, you, as a commentator, you have to register for the game that you are commentating. And uh, me, as a spectator, I can pick between 10 commentators inside the game uh, to watch the best in the world uh, go at it. League of Legends. League of Legends is a different story from the other ones. Uh, the other ones are you could call them accidents, or even if they're not accidents, it's Counter-Strike, Dota. Uh, there are people uh, basically in their basement, in their dorm room, in their garage, doing something for fun. It's purely from a gamer to another gamer, or to a one gamer to a community of millions of gamers. There's no business uh, motivation, no marketing, uh, no goal to make money. And two Dota players, who realized the, the power of the phenomenon that Dota was uh, in the mid-2000s, they said to themselves, okay, uh, what if we build a business out of this? Uh, so Brandon Beck and Mark Merrill uh, decided to create League of Legends around 2005. From what I heard, but I couldn't find a, a confirmation, they were investment bankers from New York. So they had an idea of what money was and how to make it and how important it can be to some people. Uh, so they decided to go for it and they built a startup in California um, in 2006. They hired from the Dota core team, they hired, like we saw before, they hired Watt, a uh, lead system engineer. And it's not a little fit, I mean, running a game where you have 7 million people running at all, uh, playing at all times, so it's, it takes a some knowledge and talent, I would say. And they also hired Zalias, as we saw, which was a very good soccer player. And back then, Zalias was working at Blizzard. He was working on World of Warcraft at uh, making the experience at the beginning as open as possible for new players. The game was released in 2009. April was the beta, and in October it was released. Uh, and it, was, it got successful fr uh, from the get-go. Uh, so much that Tencent acquired uh, uh, Riot Games in uh, 2011. Tencent, some people I think 
I think it's the biggest gift publisher in the world, actually, they're from China. Um, and now Dota, uh, Dota, League of Legends, sorry, is, is going higher and higher. Uh, in 2013, they had 1,000 employees, 30 million people watched the World Finals live uh, for their, the LCS, the League Championship Series, last year. I don't know the numbers for this year, it was just like 10 days ago or two weeks ago, uh, but it might be more. Uh, 67 million uh, players per month. So it's, it became a huge phenomenon and it shows what, what you can do with esports and with the passion that it generates uh, if you handle it well. And they are handling it super well. It's, uh, it's very impressive actually. So League of Legends, on their about page, on their website, they say they are the most player focused gaming company in the world. I mean, right here, it's not League of Legends. The most player focused gaming company in the world. It might sound like marketing bullshit. Uh, I've, I've, I know many publishers who say that, and it's bullshit. But it's not for them, because they are gamers in the first place. And they know how to please gamers. And they understand they have to please them a lot, and they will get a lot in return. Also, they have this approach. When I was playing StarCraft, years ago and it was starting or maybe 12 years ago it was starting to die you know in the west i was what all, everything i wanted was the same game with better graphics so that new people can come in and say oh it's nice it's pretty i want to try but i didn't care about the graphics actually i only cared about the game and it was really hard to it was i would say impossible to explain this to anyone in the industry back then and then these guys come around, and they do the same. You, know? you get into the game so much, you don't want it to end. You don't want it to finish. You, you, you never end uh, mastering it anyway. There will, be all, there will always be new players. So we want the game to keep going. Also, I want to show that because it's, it's common to all esports games. But this is really interesting when it comes to League of Legends. 1,000 hours the average time that people have spent on League of Legends, at least 3.6 million people who took the test have spent on average 1,000 hours. It's on wastedonlaw.com. Basically, you go to the website. It's a very simple site. You go to the website, you enter your League of Legends ID, and it tells you how much you play. It taps into the API. And then, it, uh, the API of the game. Then, it just, you know, um, aggregates everything get there. Just the fact that 3.6 million took, people took the test, it's, it's hard to believe actually. But I saw it grow. I saw it grow. The first time I went there, it, it was 700,000, something like that. And it's not only League of Legends. I mean, it's, it's one example. But esports games, this is what they drive. I played 5,000 hours of StarCraft, and I've never been the best player in the world. The best player in the world has, play, has played at least 15,000 hours, at least. And that's the average on League of Legends. Counter-Strike, they have wasted on CS.com. It does exist. I encourage you to go visit. The average is 2,000 hours. But there are more people. So it's, this is how you uh, uh, consume video games when you like esports and the game is working. Constantly, constantly growing since release. It's not only for hardcore gamers that want to have fun. It's for people who want to run a business. And it, it may look uh, the same from the outside, but once you get inside, it's very different. I always say video games are as vast as music, maybe more. Uh, in music, you have everything. You have all styles. You have from Mozart to the little shitty music in the elevator, uh, music for ads, the music that you listen to on the radio, uh, reggae, rap, rock, etc. And you don't make it in the, sa the same. Uh, and it's it's no big deal. I mean, um, it's not a problem if you are one style and not the other. And uh, I think for AAA publishers to want to turn like right games, it's not impossible, but it's, it's really hard uh, because it's not in that DNA, basically. So we're getting to the end now. Uh, some keys to esports. 
some because uh, there are many more, and you have to, I need to tell you, I could speak about that for hours on end. Uh, one of my biggest, uh, what I love, something I love uh, in life is to think about these games, why they are successful, how they, they got successful, what's inside of them. But here we have very little time, so to sum things up uh, and to stop here, um, you, you need a masterpiece. Uh, the game has to be legendary, nothing less. Otherwise, it will not work as an esports game. Game design. What will drive players and keep players coming back to your game is powerful emotions generated through interaction more than graphics. It's really cool to have nice graphics. It's really important. But Blizzard never had the best looking games. Never. On none of their games. Uh, Counter-Strike is number nine on Steam. It has graphics from 2000. Uh, so graphics are cool, but interactions are more important because interactions are what create addiction, basically. Challenge, never ending learning curve. You must never be able to master the game. You must always be able to learn new stuff. Time, it's not a one and ten. It's not selling people a game and then saying bye, you know. And it's, it's a passionate, lifelong relationship. People will play a game every day of their life if they really like it. Uh, or maybe not their life, but for years. So this means you need respect. You need to show a lot of respect to the players. It's, it has to go both ways. It's, to me, uh, esports need to make money. Uh, if Riot Games, those, games, those people become millionaires, it's all great. And no, no gamer will be mad at them for that because they have respect for them. And it shows at everything they do with everything they do. Net magic. And maybe that's, I mean, that's the most interesting interesting part in the end and it goes back to masterpiece how do you create a masterpiece well uh, as musicians how to create a masterpiece it's not not everyone is Mozart and that's that's really hard to accept it's uh, maybe it's unfair but that's how it is you gotta let the master work the magic that touches hearts and unconscious minds Esports games tap into the unconscious minds of people more than anyone else, uh, anything else. If you think about Counter-Strike, Counter-Strike is like being on TV every day because it's terrorism, it's counter-terrorism, it's, it's even better than movies, it's what you see on TV, it's real life. And you earn dollars in Counter-Strike and you shoot AK-47s and all these things. A Counter-Strike gamer will not tell you that's why he plays a game, but I'm sure it has a lot to do with it. What's next for esports? League of Legends, it's not that easy to learn, is it? Starcraft isn't that easy to learn. Uh, kicking a ball, it's not easy to learn either. It's instant fun. That's, to me, that's where uh, esports can grow. It can grow from the bottom. It can grow from the barrier to entry. League of Legends has 70 million players. It's a really complicated game to get into. What's great with football is that kicking a ball is instant fun. Even my grandma can have fun kicking a ball. But then Ronaldinho, when he kicks a ball, nobody does it the same. And it's to me, that's where the key is. If you want to become the biggest sport in the world, you, have some, you need something that's super accessible. And no sports game is as accessible as football at the moment. Uh, not even close. You have to be super accessible and you have to offer uh, a, f uh, a learning curve that is never uh, ending. Game makers, it's up to you. Thank you. So we have one question on Twitter, um, so we'll start there. And if anyone has any more questions to tweet, you have a couple minutes to do it, um, or I can shove a microphone in your face, whichever you prefer. Uh, so first question, why did Dota stay a Warcraft 3 mod for so long? What do you think? Huh. I think it's because the industry didn't understand the potential and didn't believe in the potential. 
if I if I could, I never. So I, I met people at Blizzard uh, for work uh, here and there, but never people from game design or you know like game directors or whatever. Uh, if I had this chance, my first question, and I've been willing to ask for a long time, is why didn't you just you know grab Dota? It was just right there. It was like the future of video games. It was at your feet, and you let it slip. Why? I can't even tell. I think it's because, well, when it comes to Blizzard, they were busy with WoW, and I mean, WoW of Warcraft was a huge success and a huge money maker, so it had to, you know, um, uh, use a lot of their attention. But more, more actually, I think the industry could not believe in, in general that one guy in his garage created this, while while they have teams of thousands, you know, um, thinking about what's next and what's the best and what's the next big thing and how we're going to make a market this and stuff. They, it's, it's so unreal. I think that's, that's why. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Do you have a question? Oh, here. Can you please elaborate a little bit more about your vision of the future of the eSports? You said instant fun, but can you maybe elaborate a little bit more is it uh, tournaments for mid-core or uh, e-sport, I don't know, one-on-one, -on -one, maybe just to, to have a little bit more simplified version of the e-sport or that? Um, so it's uh, the t success in e-sports, especially when it comes to uh, spectating. Like, how do, do you get many people watching your game? Uh, uh, do you get many people, you know, attending tournaments? Uh, is a factor of uh, the culture that you have created, basically. If you have created a big culture around your game, and many people understand your game, and many people understand what's going on on the screen and why it's exciting, uh, if you manage to do that, that's that's when you have you know a good esports game. And basically, the future of esports, to me, uh, when it comes to lowering the barrier to entry, it's it's about creating a wider, a bigger culture that more people can understand and get into. It's not about um, creating more mid-core tournaments or... Because in the end, people are interested, you know, it's a bit like a... Um, it's, it's a bit like the Greek gods. I'm interested in what the gods do, you know. Uh, I'm interested in their stories and I'm interested in the best StarCraft players in what they do. Uh, I want to be like them, uh, just like I wanted to be Michael Jordan, you know, like Michael Jordan. So when I say lowering, lowering the barrier to entry is, I mean, get more people to enjoy your game at the fun level, the pure fun level. I, what video games are at the very beginning, they are, you know, a great entertainment. The more people you will have uh, entertained by your game, the more people you will have watching it. The more people you will have being fans of, you know, the, the best players, the more, the more successful it will be as an esports. So it's it's really uh, that's why I'm saying by lowering the barrier to entry. Anyone else? I think we have time for one more question. Oh yeah, we have five minutes till the next session, so we're gonna keep this brief. Okay. Okay. So I saw this hand first. I'm gonna give it to you. Uh, hi, I would like to know your point of view on uh, Heroes of the Storm. Uh, the new uh, MOBA from Blizzard. Mm -hmm. Do you know it will be a, a great game for eSports or no? Uh, so I didn't play it. Uh, I'm curious. I'm really curious. Uh, I didn't expect Earthstone to be what it is. Uh, I thought it would be a great game, but I didn't think it would like rock everything like it does. So it, it shows that Blizzard can do amazing stuff in the field. Uh, not only make great games, but make great eSports games. But the issue with Heroes of the Storm, to me, is uh, the field. Uh, League of Legends and Dota, they're already like using a lot of space uh, in MOBAs. It's crazy. Th those two games, they use the same map, basically. <laughs> uh, it's, and they have uh, almost 10 million players uh, playing each day. Is there room for more in the MOBAs uh, genre? Uh, maybe. Then Blizzard, what they're trying to do is also with uh, Heroes of the Storm is, is they're trying to lower the barrier, uh, like they did with Hearthstone and card games. Uh, if you compare Hearthstone to Magic, it's a lot more fun in the first hours. Uh, so th that's what they're trying to achieve. But 
once again, the difference between card games and MOBAs is that the MOBAs uh, genre is crowded right now. So I'm curious to see if they, if they can put it out. But I wouldn't be s that surprised if they actually failed. OK. Well, thank you guys for coming. And thank you, Nicholas. I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Thank you.